for this morning's message. This morning's sermon comes from the book of Exodus, 17th chapter, verses 1 through 7. And I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version Bible. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the spirit, but the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders with you. Take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you and on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah. The Israelites quarreled because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying is the Lord among us or not the word of God for the people of God thanks be to God may God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's word our sermon title is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted. O oh God, my rock and my redeemer, clean me up, God. Forgive me for sin so that the people may hear you and there will be nourishment provided from that of the pulpit to the pews to those watching virtually in your name amen is the lord among us or not there's an old gospel song with the words if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me, where would I be? Where would I be? God kept my enemies away and let the sun shine in through a cloudy day. Oh, God wrapped me in the cradle of the Holy One's arms. When God knew I had been battered, and warn. So if it had not been for God on my side, tell me where would I be? Where would I be? And when I used to hear those old saints in New Orleans sing that song, I, I, I didn't grasp it all as a child, as a teenager, 
even early on as a, a young adult, but as I have walked with God and hearing God tell me I'm here with you, and if I ever think that God wasn't with me, I can reflect back on some experiences that only God brought us through. So if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Some of you all may be reflecting, where would you be? So reflect upon those words. And with the title, if it had not been for the Lord, think about it. Are you thinking? Are you thinking? Well, Pastor, God, it doesn't appear God has always, hasn't always. It appears that God hasn't always been on my side because of some of the terrible things I have experienced. My response to you, are you sure? Are you sure? God wasn't with you. Have you ever been so angry with God because you felt that the Holy One had forgotten all about you? Forgotten all about you as you were hurting. Forgotten all about you when you were going through desperate times. Did you take your pain out on other folks? Other loved ones? Those dear to you or those helping you. I remember early on in COVID, I always would make a point to thank people when we go to the grocery stores because sometimes people would holler and become so angry because there wasn't any toilet paper in the stores or any bleach, or any whatever that was desperately needed. And they took it out on the cashiers or the managers. And every time I would get close to them, I would say, thank you for everything that you're doing. I know it's not easy out here. Thank you for the cleaning. Thank you for what you're doing. One person teared up when I, got, when I said that. She said, thank you because nobody knows what I'm going through. I have a family. I'm afraid of COVID too. But I'm doing the best that I can. So let's see how the text for today can bring insight into how we can be just like people in antiquity, just like the children of Israel. Anyone who has been a leader has experienced followers becoming disenchanted, angry, disillusioned with you, and frustrated with you at times. Remember Jesus' followers? All those disciples weren't always hunky-dory with Jesus. But here in our text, we have Moses, the leader of the Israelites, as called by God, experiencing some angry people. <laughs> yes, Moses is experiencing some difficulty with his followers. Or should it be said, there's difficulty with those who are claiming to follow God. The people are in dire need of water. Humanity can go without food for a limited period of time, you know, fasting. But water or lack of it, leading to extreme thirst, to the, part that you, to the point that you can't swallow is another thing. That's why Jesus is known as the living water to Christians. We just can't do without him. 
So here in the text it says, The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Then the people go on to say, we could have remained in Egypt for all the stuff we're going through here. But the question that comes to my mind, why did the Israelites not question directly the sovereign leader, God, to give them water? God provides Israel with law or statue by which to test their faithfulness toward God, the Holy One, the Omnipotent One, all power. Will the people, will Moses believe and have faith and trust even in the tough and difficult times. Has God tested you lately regarding your faithfulness? Has God tested you lately regarding your faithfulness and trust in the Holy One? Moses cries out to the people, why do you test the Lord, that line would not leave me. I would wake up at night. Why would you test the Lord? So I went to one. I did some research prior to going to this person. But I wanted to make sure it's good to have different resources. And so I went to one fluent in Hebrew and that of Dr. Alan Gold. Thank you, Dr. Gold. To see if the word test in the Hebrew language has the same meaning as in the English translation. There are two words in the Hebrew language for test. I will focus or we will focus on the word nasa, which has more of the idea of challenge as depicted in our text today, the test. But before going to Dr. Gold, like I said, I had learned that nasa is a Hebrew verb, it's an action word, truly does mean to test. But another resource said it can also mean to see or doubt. Hmm. However, it does not imply provoking one to act in a certain way as the English verb temp does, like it's stipulated in the King James Version. So why am I going through all of this? Why is it so significant? Because the people challenged Moses to justify his leadership to provide water. They insisted that their thirst denied the validity of his leadership. <laughs> Were they truly trying to challenge the validity of God? Using Moses as a smokescreen or sort of sorts. Instead of quarreling concerning validation, why not go directly to God to seek assistance in troubled times? It wasn't the time to test or challenge or whatever in my opinion, but it is the time to seek divine intervention during troubling times. One may ask, why would God take the people on a path that had limited water? Remember I said, or the text says, 
Moses was directed to go that way. Didn't I mention earlier about testing and faithfulness? Not of God, but of the people to check their trust levels. When we are in relationship with God, we must remember there will be hard times. But reflect upon past deliverances in order to hold on to your trust in God. The Israelites had gone through the parting of the Red Sea, past victory as delivered by God. And don't be so hard on the Israelites saying, well, if God would have parted the Red Sea for me, I would have kept, uh-uh. There have been some Red Seas in your life because it's called life. And God has delivered all of us, many of us, through those difficult times, past victories that only God could have delivered. Now, I would be remiss if I would not acknowledge that preaching becomes unreal and just sentimental when it ignores the fact that many thousands of believing people have died in the agonies of their thirst and want even while praying to God. Is your thirst healing of a loved one to live? Is your thirst reconciliation with family members? Is your thirst to receive financial healing? Is your thirst for social justice? Is your thirst for the end of the COVID pandemic? Whatever your thirst may be, whatever your hurt may be, I, I remember this story being told when I was a little girl, and I couldn't understand really. We would go to church in this Grandmother would pray for her grandson to stop drinking and get on the right track and, and be with God. That grandmother would pray and pray. She didn't care who knew about it, didn't suffer any embarrassment, so she said, but she prayed and she prayed and she prayed. And the grandmother died. But one Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday morning, <laughs> that grandson came to the church and said, I want to repent of everything. Just accept me in. My grandmother prayed for me. I've been clean from alcohol for a year. I never thought that I could do it, but she believed in me and kept on praying. Is the Lord among us or not? She went to her grave. But the fulfillment of the prayers were still revealed. Is it in hardness of heart and lack of faith to ask, is the Lord among us or not? But let's reflect upon this. God does not promise to give people what they want, but the Holy One does promise to satisfy abundantly all who trust. Sometimes that abundance can come forth in just being able to move forward in hope and trust as we journey through the difficult and hard times. Some people asked that grandmother, how can you keep praying the same prayer 
every Sunday. Don't you think if God was going to answer, God would have answered by now? She kept coming to the altar in hope and trust as she journeyed. And as I said, sometimes the, the, the promises of God is not seen by that actual person. Remember Abraham? God told him he would be the father of many nations. He didn't witness the fulfillment. But to his dying day, Abraham believed, Abraham trusted, and moved forward wherever God told him to go. And it's our commitment, yours, mine, to believe until our dying day. The world may say it's foolish, but we know that it's about faith and trust. So through this text, let's learn that God always stands before and with us. God always stands before and with us. What does verse 5 and 6 say? The Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God will go before us, will be there with us, but it's about trusting. It's about believing. And you remember Moses was the one that kept saying, you know, God, I can't talk, I can't speak. God said, go. God gave him that staff, that visualization. He had struck, the, the, the text said, struck the Nile. Now God is saying, strike the rock. So as we, we believe that God always stands before and with us, we have to be obedient and we have to trust and go forward. Then we learn that blaming others does not remove the pain and difficulties experienced in life. Let me say that again. It didn't work for the Israelites. Why do you think it will work for us? They were blaming Moses. Did that help them? No. Not until Moses asked for direction and help because the people were about to stone him. Blaming others does not remove the pain and difficulties. And that leads us into it's okay to cry out to God and to expect your quenching of thirst miracle. Mm. It's okay to cry out to God and to expect your quenching of thirst miracle. All we have to do is walk in obedience to God like Moses. And this is for the leaders out there. <laughs> Leadership is not for the faint of heart. Leadership is not for the faint of heart. We must all keep our focus on the goodness of the Lord and that God is always among us. And, and, and when times get tough for me, and I'm human, I'm the pastor, 
I'm the leader. Back back on what First Thessalonians 5 and 24 says. The one who calls you is faithful and will do it. The one who calls you is faithful and will do it. Will do what? Will give me the tools, give us the tools that we need to carry on the work. Even in my weaknesses, as Paul said, God's grace is sufficient. It's not about me being all-powerful or you being all-powerful and strong. It's about depending and trusting God. So leadership is not for the faint of heart, but the one who calls you is faithful. And God will do it. I kept rereading this text over and over and over and asking God, why? What is in this for me? It's not just about the people. It's never just about you all. I must be fed too. I'm in relationship with God through the risen Christ too. Every Sunday, I need to be fed. Every day, I need to be fed. And every one of these points hit me. Sometimes I forget that God is before me and with me. And sometimes I forget that blaming others doesn't take away. If you want to know what I'm talking about, contact first gentleman Nelson Ross. He receives the brunt of the pain and the difficulties I experience. And he has said, don't blame me. I need to go to God. And it never fails. When I cry out to God and I expect the miracle, even if the miracle doesn't happen the way I want it to happen, I receive such peace in order to go forward. Because sometimes I can go backwards. And finally, as a leader, I, I, I'm repeating this. This is for me now. As a leader, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and God, thank you for helping all the leaders in this church. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. Because doing God's work is not for the faint of heart. Heart. Amen. We will have the goodness of God.